everybody. You're listening to the Comic Book Bears podcast. I'm Billy Z. I'm Steve Morey. And unfortunately, we don't have Brian or Justin with us tonight, but we have a very special guest, which I think you'll be very happy to hear about. If you are a hairy, heavy homo like those who are behind this podcast, then you know all about Lovable Loaf. And we are so pleased to bring to the show for the first time that man behind that amazing series. Please welcome Ed Luce. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's, it's great to finally have you on. I don't know what's taken so long, but it's remedied tonight. Ed, when we bring somebody on, we're kind of like lover boy, and we start from the start, and we ask a very basic question. How did you first get involved in comics? Well, it is somewhat of a sordid tale, and I have listened to your podcast, so I, I am familiar with the myriad of answers that people give. Um, the short answer is that in middle school, uh, when uh, I was still collecting toys, a lot of G.I. Joe, Transformers, all of that, um, it became uncool uh, because everybody was discovering girls, and obviously that was not going to happen for me. Uh, so comics was still the kind of fun, playful thing that was related to toys that I could get into and hang out with people and talk about without being completely ostracized. So, uh, I got into X-Men, uh, I was a Marvel guy at first and, uh, you know, as most people branched out from there, got into DC comics were so cheap back then that you could buy them by the arm loads. Uh, they varied wildly in quality. I guess they do today. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just kind of found myself uh, hiding in, to some degree, uh, taking refuge in comics just because I there were things I realized about myself that uh, I wasn't quite fitting in. Um, so, yeah, that was that was my first entryway. This was like, I guess, in the late 80s. And I think my first comic that I bought um, with the collecting in mind was... Uncanny X-Men 247, it was Jim Lee's first book. He was mm-hmm. like a villain art. Yeah. And in terms mm-hmm. of your own work, I know that you are an art professor, and, and I know you have a background in fine art. You were once a painter, is that correct? How did yeah. you transition over to sequential work? Gosh, well, it was the sort of thing where I knew I didn't have the chops. As much as I loved comics in high school, I knew I didn't have the chops to draw like my heroes at the time. Uh, as I said, Jim Lee, Bart Sears. Uh, I'm trying to think of it was, you know, that whole image crowd actually had just made the transition into uh, from Marvel into um, image. So I had to get real. I wanted to go to school for art. My parents were very supportive. Uh, they wanted me to go to because they both had had jobs that they weren't particularly proud of. And they just kept saying, you know, we want you to do what you love. So I went into college uh, specifically for graphic design. But uh, after about a semester of that, I realized I did not have the technical rigor, um, the, the cleanness and the, the perfectionist sort of drive to, to execute that job. So I went into illustration, which at the school I went to, which was uh, SUNY Fredonia uh, in Western upstate New York, the hybrid of graphic design and fine art was illustration. So uh, my teacher, Alberto Ray, uh, took me under his wing. Uh, and I kind of took off from there, and by the end of it, had kind of evolved into a comic illustrator, but I didn't know that. Uh, I was just sort of illustrating things a, a panel at a time, basically. Um, from there, I, I reached the end of college and uh, had a kind of idealistic, I don't want to sell out phase. So I, for my senior year, trashed my illustration portfolio. Not literally, but I, I put it in the corner and did an entire show of paintings. And they were very cartoony, very comic booky. I called them my recovering Catholic paintings. They were all <laughs> sort of perverted. Yeah. They were all sort of perverted religious icons. Everybody was like, what the hell is he doing? He's crazy. You know, uh, I, I didn't get a lot of, of work published while I was in uh, college, but the local newspaper always had a contest where they would publish the best uh, illustration students' work um, for that particular week. They would they would send out the story, and we would all kind of compete um, to get published for it. Uh, and I, you know, I did pretty decent in in that uh, regard. But I came to realize that I was not very good at interpreting other people's ideas. I wanted to be in the driver's seat when it came to making art. So paintings, you know, what were what I made for that that uh, senior show. Uh, I decided I wanted to go to grad school, uh, partially as a means to, to get a degree to teach, but also to get the heck out of uh, Western New York. 
So I applied to a bunch of schools in California. The school I got into didn't have any drawing program. It was a painting program. Uh, so I had to morph into a painter for those three years that I studied at UC San Diego. Uh, and then from there, this is getting really long-winded. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> from there, I moved back to uh, upstate New York to become an art professor at Alfred University, where I routinely um, told my students to stop drawing cartoons and draw this lovely still life that I had put up in the corner of the room. So um, I sort of came uh, full circle. I drank the fine arts Kool-Aid, not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but by the time uh, I had run, run my course through teaching, sort of got, got through with that as a career uh, moving to San Francisco, um, I picked up graphic design of all things. I became a graphic designer for a mom and pop art uh, store uh, in San Francisco. And uh, suddenly rubbed up against the uh, indie comic scene there and uh, sort of thought to myself, I can do this. You know, um, I have all the technical skills, uh, theoretically, to pull this off. So it just became about coming up with ideas and building a little world. And that's what ended up being what we love. OK. Now, in terms of that world that you mentioned that you built, Sure, you've had to make elevator pitches in recent times. Maybe not pitch, but at least a Reader's Digest encapsulation about what OAF is about. Why don't you tell us about the world of Lil Papa and Smusher and you know, all these wonderful denizens that inhabit that world and, and basically what OAF is about? Yeah, well, it's weird because I haven't ever had to pitch, um, but I, I do have my, my shortened version of things. The, the thing that you are... You train yourself to come up with when you're at a comic convention and someone wanders along and looks at all of your stuff. Um, I always say it's a book about big, scary, hairy guys and the people uh, who love them and cats. <laughs> and if the person hasn't run off by then, I usually say, but it's also about uh, music and fashion. And uh, it's basically a platform for me to talk about all, all the pop cultural things that I love. Mm hmm. Now, again, you mentioned music just now. Ove's other half, Eiffel, his name comes directly from a Pixie song. There's Smith mm -hmm. depictions, metal references all over the place. I still long for the day where there actually is a disco grindcore group. Uh, so uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about how music infuses your work regularly? Well, I uh, growing up, uh, I didn't have MTV. My parents refused to get cable. So I would sit at the edge of my bed um, either with headphones on or with a Walkman or later on an iPod. And I would just listen to the music and come up with the videos in my head. Uh, uh, oftentimes I would be the star of those. Sometimes I would come up with these characters in my head, um, I, all based on the meaning. You know, there, I was I was interpreting the songs for myself, um, not having uh, music videos readily uh, available to do that for me. So I always equate um, listening to music with some level of visualization. Uh, that's changed, you know, when I'm working, I have music on in the background and I'm, you know, my visualization skills are all uh, used up drawing. Uh, but a lot of the early kind of looks for the character, as you mentioned, some of the characters are spinning directly out of lyrics. Um, it's this effort to pay tribute to music, uh, you know, because I'm not musically inclined at all uh, to, to sort of venerate it. Um, a lot of, it just inspires me. Uh, as you said, the Eiffel character is lifted directly out of, uh, Alec Eiffel. The first appearance of the character is him standing below an archway, you know, completely, um, painted out by the, the lyrics of that Pixie song. So, um, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's always been a real strong influence. A lot of the Oaks, um, personality before you get to know him, um, you already know what it might be just because you know, he's a Morrissey fan, you know, he's a Smiths fan. So. As it evolved, as the references became more prevalent, um, it became a way to instantly connect with a certain group of people um, just based on a, a love of a certain type of music or, or a certain artist or a certain song. Um, all of the early Oak issues have a, a front inside cover that has a quote, and they were all Smith's quotes. Um, I think, though, actually, that's not entirely accurate because later on there is a um, hidden cameras quote. Mm. Um, is my boyfriend from the song music is my boyfriend and there's also a pete uh shelley quote um so i don't want to you know i don't want to get too heavy-handed with the smith stuff in recent years it's sort of drifted out of what i do and the heavy metal stuff has ramped up a little bit more 
Um, but yeah, I mean, as I said, it's it's where I draw my inspiration from, and it, I found that it makes an instant connection with, with people that may not know my comic, but at least know, um, you know, some of the tastes of my characters based on their music taste. Okay. I'm going to throw the interview baton over to Steve. Steve, what do you have for Ed? Well, it's funny that you're talking about music. Um, one of the uh, the comic series that you've been involved in, um, not necessarily Wubble Below, although that is wonderful, um, has been um, the Henry and Glenn Forever um, mm-hmm. <laughs> series uh, by, uh, I guess, the Igloo Tornado Collective. Um, I think Tom Neely is is pretty much uh, still is still really pushing um, or, or making that stuff together with other artists. What kind of hooked you up with them and of course brought to life uh your version of henry and glenn <laughs> um sure. and a couple of your um, stories that you've had with them yeah yeah uh, it's fair to say that tom neely is the driving force behind it now uh and of course his his group of collaborators has expanded exponentially as the project has grown um, the, I came into contact with Tom at, uh, Stumptown in Portland, uh, which is sort of a dearly departed indie comic show that was going on there for, for several years. The very first show that, uh, I, I exhibited at, Tom was my neighbor. Uh, and, you know, of course, being a straight guy, very, but also straight guy from LA, very open, you know, very progressive, very liberal attitudes. He, I did not know, had been working on this comic, Henry and Glenn, for years at that point. Uh, he had become a fan of what I was doing, and at the end of that show, he handed me the, the very first uh, little Henry and Glenn mini and said, oh, this is my gay comic. And I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, and then I immediately saw the concept. It, it's this you know, fictitious domestic partnership between uh, Henry Rollins and Glenn Danzig, two musicians that I you know, have loved since I was 12 or 13. Um, so, in just quickly glancing over that and being amazed by it, I said, if you ever open this up to anyone else, please, you know, consider me. I have ideas for this, just the, the two or three minutes I've been looking at it. Um, Henry Rollins was probably the single biggest sort of turn on for me during college. I had him <laughs> all over my walls. Uh, it was during his sort of a uh, breakthrough crossover, um, phase for MTV, um, but it was safe to put this guy in little tiny black shorts on my wall, uh, in and amongst my, you know, straight roommates. I was, of course, closeted at the time, uh, next to my Phil and Salmo from Pantera, also shirtless posters. So, um, <laughs> I just, as I said, I had a lot of opinions. Um, th- those two being, I will say my heroes, uh, once their music careers and their, their musical relevance started to run its course, I became a fan of their very strange um, failed acting careers. Uh, (laughs) More so of Danzig. Henry's made a a good run of it. It it almost seems as if he's got a deal with Netflix these days. He's released like two or three movies on Netflix. uh, Yeah. That are, I'm sorry, Hank, Uncle Hank, they are awful. They are terrible. (laughs) Uh, I I can't say that I've watched any of the ones that have popped up. I, I keep seeing getting recommended to me by netflix and i'm like i i know i want to i know i want to gawk at them but i i i kind of had this i still have this image just like you had that you know the poster on the wall that's the image of henry rollins that i still have in my head um you know the late 90s early 2000s kind of like beefy angry poet kind of henry rollins um and i don't think i could see henry being dramatic and sad yeah this is where age is showing because still my image of henry is longish hair doing family man as a spoken (laughs) word on 120 minutes oh god i'm even older than that the cutting edge (laughs) god you guys are making me feel old okay Well, I became familiar, I'll be perfectly honest, with this spoken word. Uh, wasn't in the black flag. Black flag was, like, too harsh for me at the time. Uh, but there, he was just sort of cultivating this, like, I'm your best friend persona through this spoken word. He was processing a lot of negative emotions, uh, bad experiences in his life. He was processing the whole black flag thing, basically. Uh, his friend, Joe Cole, had been killed, you know, not long before he, he started uh, really pounding the pavement with the spoken word stuff. So he really just sort of felt like this older brother guy who 
you know, would whisper in my ear these sweet nothings and tell me <laughs> it was going to be okay. <laughs> and then I got into his music. I've never been a huge Rollins band fan, um, but I mean, it's undeniable the, the videos he was putting out got my attention, um, whether or not I was super into the music, and then got into Black Flag much more later. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. So with this with this uh, comic series itself, uh, one of the stories that you had done, uh, I want to say it's maybe for the second or third big collection that they had, uh, the Henry and Raul, uh, Henry Henry and Glenn forever and ever. I think it was the big the big one recently. Um, there was one that you did Henry and Glo- Henry and Glenn for five more minutes or something, um, <laughs> where they're actually at a couple's counselor and that. To me, it was one of the probably um, I'd say one of the more serious quotes, serious stories uh, in the collection. But it was also very um, different from your style uh, that I, I come to expect from Bubble Loaf, um, where I guess everything was a, a little bit more um, uh, realistically detailed in certain aspects, except for the fact that Henry's eyes are like pennies. Um, they're these very intense, perfect things. And I'm like, you know, it captures that so well. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but yeah, it just, it, it was very heartfelt. And, you know, like most of the stories tend to be uh, with this because a lot of people clearly show their love for the characters and the concept. But, um, you know, that kind of, uh, that story as well as, uh, I think there's another one also in the same, in the same collection. Um, are those... Is that type of work, you know, where you're collaborating with someone else, um, where you're working within their concept, is that something that you like to do uh, just as much as you like to do your own stuff? Or do you really like to kind of be your own boss when it comes to what will love you just, you know, uh, you prefer to kind of take your own concepts, take your stories and work that way more so than collaboration? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the collaboration with the Henry and Glenn stuff happened in the sense that Tom came up with the concept and he was like, do whatever you want with it. Uh, and, uh, and a little bit of insight into my story in that I, I felt like I did, as you pointed out, have a much more um, personal story to tell uh, being a gay man, at least at that point, being one of the few gay men that had contributed to that book. Um, most of it was, was straight guys and they have their own take on it and that's cool. Uh, but mine, um, was a bit more serious and that was because it was very much patterned after the one and only time, uh, I went to couples therapy with my 10 years gone now, uh, ex. What that, that whole comic with Henry Gunn was patterned after that experience. And there's a moment where, um, the doctor says to, I think it's Glenn, what does Henry have to do to keep you in this relationship? And that was word for word what the therapist said to me uh, <laughs> and my ex. Um, so it was very much based on, on you know, disparity going on in, in the careers of Henry and Glenn. That was inspired by a disparity that was going on in my then relationship. Um, but to answer the other part of your question, I don't generally like to um, take scripts from other people and draw them. Uh, I do tend to uh, prefer to, to be in the driver's seat uh, and that has a lot to do with what I was saying earlier uh, in my schooling, discovering as an illustration major that I didn't really love taking someone else's ideas and, and turning them into pictures. It was always hard to kind of find my inlet mm-hmm. into a story. Or another another reason that I don't take commissions is that, um, I hate to say it, but the person that I'm drawing really has to inspire, um, you know, a drawing for me. They have to kind of conjure it from me. I don't like phoning it in. I don't like phoning in um, commission portraits or, uh, you know, stories, uh, someone else's story drawing it. I, I have been periodically asked, especially recently, um, here's a script. Um, one of them was for a wrestling comic and uh, a wrestler. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, I should really do this. But I could not get into the story. And ultimately, I just sort of had to say no. I can't. Um, uh, and that, that's mostly because uh, for at least my artistic production, it takes a, Herc- a Herculean amount of energy and time um, to pull this thing off. So uh, I would rather pour my energy into uh, something that I haven't seen before. Um, usually that's something that I have had to write and I've had to come up with. Um, so for those reasons, I, I don't. Uh, and I've been blessed uh, with a lot of the people that I've done anthology work for or collection work for. Um, they just let me do my thing. And that's really wonderful. And I, I think um, I tend to gravitate more towards those sorts of projects. 
Well, that's that's actually pretty cool. I you know I do definitely respect that, and it's it's very interesting to to hear that, um, you know, from somebody with the indie comics background that you have, you know, working with anthologies, being able to do your own thing. That's definitely something that's very much a, a factor in the indie world, and you know, or the comics or the comics with an X or like the zine type of uh, type of culture. Uh, we don't really get that a lot with any of the mainstream um, comics houses. You know, we're you might be able to kind of do your own thing, but there's a parameter that you have to fall within, um, and that's pretty cool. Uh, now, you you mentioned very briefly about wrestling, <laughs> and uh, you know a, a potential collaboration for, with a wrestling comic. Um, so obviously, wrestling's just as much as music is seems to be a very big influence on your stories, on your characters. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've talked about this before with other people, but, uh, I haven't really followed wrestling or anything, you know, whether it's WWF to WWE or even the new Lucha Underground, even though I hear it's really cool, um, <laughs> um, since I was a kid, but that kind of, uh, my memories of what it was like as a kid, I could definitely see a lot of that, um, you know, just sort of coming through in, in your work and, and, uh. I was wondering if you could pick any time period, whether it's the 80s, the 90s, potential, you know, anything that's current, throw your favorite characters together with, you know, uh, Goldblut um, or anybody like that uh, in a house together and do some kind of kayfabe kind of thing. What would you do? And would you potentially want to put that into an actual comic and just <laughs> like... Uh, you- <laughs> you're asking about the specific era that i would want to yeah pick. like what would you what would you like if you could take characters from that era and maybe put together with your you know with your creation what would you want to do who would you want to see well i would preface this by saying you just basically described my next project oh uh, no. <laughs> yeah unintentionally it's, it's, unintentionally i swear <laughs> yeah it's a well and i've been really putting the wrestling stuff out there lately um mostly because i've been doing a lot of homework getting ready for this project um, but the, the next, uh, published work, uh, I expect that will be from Fanographics. They've more or less given me the green light for it is a, uh, a floppy, uh, miniseries, uh, five issues, uh, just focusing on a narrative about the wrestlers. And I'm, I'm firmly rooting it in that kind of trashy, fairly un-PC, uh, mid to late eighties era. And so that would be my answer. I would, I would say definitely that, that time period. So like gorgeous ladies of wrestling, but with bigger, beefier dudes. Oh no, it's like <laughs> no, it's like the AWA. I mean, oh yeah. 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 Well, you had said earlier uh, that you didn't really, uh, you haven't been following wrestling in the last twenty plus years potentially, and I think that that's something that a lot of folks that are around my age would absolutely uh, relate to. I go in and out of it all the time, uh, especially when the all of the wrestlers look like MMA fighters. I was like, I don't, this is, <laughs> I don't get, I don't get this. I don't get the appeal of it. None of these characters have any charisma. There's no, um, I again, my my view of wrestling is, uh, it's superheroes. It's just modern day real life superheroes. They have costumes. They have bigger than life personas. There are good guys. There are bad guys. They turn, you know, personalities, they turn heel, they, they turn face. Um, so really, when I injected uh, wrestling into the Wolf of the comic, it was with this thought that this is as close to superheroes as I'm, I'm willing to get in this otherwise fairly, you know, realistic world. Um, I had created, when I was writing the, the very first Oak comics, a persona for him that was a superhero persona. Um, the devil had given him superpowers so that he could save all the kitties in the world, but the rub was that he scared all cats whenever he transformed into this goat creature. Uh, and my my one friend and, and sort of editor, Matt Wilkinsmith, was like, ugh, do you really want to make this a superhero comic? And he made me really think about it, so when I decided not to, and I sort of transformed that into the goat blood character who, you know, has been around since issue zero, he's, he's the logo of the comics in print, um, Matt was relieved. He was like, oh, thank God, you're, you're not going to do that. <laughs> um, so the, once I had sort of shelved that basic idea, the plan was always in the second or third issue to reveal him as, as a wrestler. He had a, a, had a hidden past and mm-hmm. he had retired scandal. Um, just so I could uh, revisit that later and inject 
uh, a lot of the body types and a lot of the sort of over the top drama that that wrestling the wrestling I appreciated the most I've had. Um, and in that way, I avoided making a comic that was just about chubby guys and cats, you know. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, by the way, would would still be amazingly awesome. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, and, and uh, talking about the body types, I mean, I think that that is one of the big differences when you look at twenty plus years ago to today. I mean, everybody today, like you said, looks like an MMA fighter, or they look like. You know, like they just walked out of a, a Gold's Gym, uh, slapped on some spandex and a mask, and uh, there you go. You got uh, you got all the wrestlers. Um, but uh, I think uh, recently I've been seeing some, um, uh, you know, a lot of people talking about some underground stuff where there seems to be a move to kind of bring back the different body types, the over-the-top personalities. Not, not the polished kind that you see in WWE, but... Um, you know, something that is a little bit more homebrew and very amateurish. And I think that kind of mixed with the overtop craziness is, is something that uh, appeals to me. And I'm sure a lot of other people with that kind of 80s nostalgia. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's fun to see. And I, I, I really do appreciate when I when I uh, see that in somebody's work. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we're we're living in this really uh, golden age of indie wrestling. You know, there had to be an alternative sort of pushback against the WWE stuff because, it. I mean, number one, WWE run by Christian conservative folks. Uh, so my <laughs> From Connecticut. Mission, From Connecticut, yeah. all places. <laughs> my entire mission statement with this GoFla miniseries is what if the WWE was run by progressive liberal types instead of uh, you know the WWE, uh, but really that's that's paralleling what's going on right now in in indie wrestling. You've got, as you mentioned, Lucha Underground, which is on the El Rey Network, Robert Rodriguez's um, TV network, which is great. It it seamlessly fuses the telenovela with like uh, you know WWE type action. It's intergender. Uh, in fact, uh, for anybody that's not really watching it, spoiler: it, for a brief time they had a female champion of the entire league. Um, that had to beat a man to get that. Um, there's Ring of Honor. There's New Japan. There's uh, What Culture. Um, all of these are great. Um, all of these, uh, Hood Slam, which is actually in my backyard uh, in Oakland. Um, yeah, there's just this, I think people have this nostalgia for the crazy, you know, uh, unconventional, on PC, really over-the-top eras of the 80s and 90s, and to, to some degree, I think the early 2000s. So they're just, they're just making it happen. They're, they're bringing it into being and, and doing it via the internet and via YouTube. So it's wonderful. I am endlessly entertained. I have no shortage uh, of, of videos to watch. Broken Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy was the most boring wrestler. Me. Sorry, Matt Hardy fans. Um, and he <laughs> lost his mind, and now he plays this like super villain character with a white streak in his hair. Um, and it's great. It's amazing. <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, one of the other things that comes back, other than the, the craziest of storylines, is body types. You're, you're really – you're looking at more than just the the waxed, uh, you know, pretty boys. You're seeing the big dudes with big guts and, like, fur on their shoulders and just, you know, looking crazy and definitely looking like they probably shouldn't be climbing in and out of a ring um, and jumping around. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, and that's, that's what I love. I love seeing that. Of course, obviously, there's some, you know – the, when you're a little gay boy and you're looking for hairy shirtless dudes on TV, that's the best way to see it. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, who's who's on tonight? Awesome. Uh, but um, that is pretty dang cool. So, but yeah, anyway, yeah, uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was oh, gonna no. say every single wrestling league that I just mentioned has one long bearded, shave headed guy in it with who doesn't wax. Uh, so as I said. <laughs> I was slim pickings when I was growing up. All I had really was uh, Jim the Anvil Nightheart. Now there are dozens of Jim the Anvil Nightheart. So. Nice. <laughs> well, let's move on from wrestling, and because uh, I think I've I think I've bogarted that. <laughs> okay. We'll tie in wrestling going back to Oaf there. The second Fantagraphics volume, let's say, of Love of Oaf was Blood and Metal. And what was behind your decision to show Oaf prior to being in a relationship? Yeah, well, uh, as I'm sure you guys have talked about and, and numerous guests on on the show have talked about, um, you put something out into the world and you, you lose a measure of control over it. And you start this conversation with a much larger group of people 
And uh, you that changes what you do, uh, but to some degree. In my case, certainly, I was very intent to, on listening uh, to what people had to say, basically. And um, the predominant, um, you know, positive feedback I got was uh, all about the the cats and the uh, the big dudes and how they played wonderfully off each other and cats, cats, cats. And oh, I love cats. And <laughs> that was great for me to hear. I love cats too. But uh, I started to realize that creatively uh, that could be very um, self-fine. That could be very uh, detrimental to me wanting to work if I just sort of uh, only made and recycled cat jokes and, and big guy jokes. And uh, there's a lot of that already out there. I mean. When I was forming um, the Blood and Metal, the, the second volume, I became very consciously aware that the era of the um, internet cat celebrity had completely vanished. <laughs> uh, you weren't really seeing that anymore. And, and for a while, a lot of people were coming up to me uh, in a little bit of a passive aggressive way and saying, oh, yeah, you really got the cat market. You really got the cat audience. That, that must write itself. So... <laughs> Having all of these really lofty ambitions and, and artistic notions of myself, I started to just say, you know, um, I don't want it. I don't, I could do this forever and ever, over and over again in different iterations. And, um, and he, I could make a lot of people happy, but that's not what I want to do right now. I want to delve deeper into the wrestling and stuff. So the Blood and Metal book is this very conscious effort to not completely forsake those folks. Um, but uh, reach out and, and go down a different avenue and keep things creatively interesting for myself. If music and wrestling has been a part of the comic from very early on, if there's a lot of uh, page count devoted to that in the first volume, okay. let me go down that route a little bit uh, more deeply. And, and the Vice comics allowed me to do that. Um, Vice asked me to do a web comic, uh, a run of web comics uh, last year, and I was basically, I said yes, because I knew that it was this wonderful opportunity to get more creative, uh, but also I knew I was creating pages for the next anagraphic, basically. So um, that book, the Blood and Metal book, is made up of a lot of the music stuff that I've done for other collections and anthologies. Um, there's a Celtic Frost story in there. There's a Merciful Fate story in there. Um, there's a story, uh, there's a hardcore story. So I kind of think of that as like a mixtape of sorts, that, that second volume. Um, it's playing with a lot of different musical genres and wrestling thrown together. So the blood is the wrestling and the metal is the actual mm -hmm. music part. Uh, and the title was actually influenced by um, Penelope uh, Spiris, who did Decline of Western uh, Civilization 1 through 3 and Wayne's World. Um, I assume this was a for hire job. Uh, mm -hmm. She released a one-off project that was... Uh, called Thunder and Mud, mm -hmm. and it was this female wrestling in mud and uh, heavy metal uh, hour-long special. Uh, so I'm just kind of riffing on that in a in a kind of queer way. So that was that was the initial inspiration for it. If you go to YouTube and you Google Thunder and Mud, you should be able to find clips. The whole thing isn't on there, but that was my sort of uh, concept template for for the new book. Yeah, I recently watched a lot of videos with her with the with the Blu-ray release of the Decline collection, mm -hmm. and it just some really interesting. Uh, you know, a lot of personal appearances both in New York and Los Angeles, and just some really interesting perspectives on some of the stuff that was covered in those. But yeah, yeah. I, I would want to check that out. Uh, my favorite element of both, and I think you are very good at this in telling a story economically. Is there any chance we'll ever see Eiffel's really bad breakups expanded? Uh, I, I had a series, uh, and I think I've actually written the scripts for these, is um, Why is Eiffel so angry? And there are just some semi-autobiographical little snippets of things that have happened to me that I, you know, I, it's no secret there are parts of Eiffel that are me. They're the less charming aspects, obviously. Um, they're the jealous aspects and the narcissistic aspects. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm sorry. You were asking if uh, if he had uh, if I was going to do more of the, right, the worst yeah. date. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could. Uh, right now, the the way that that storyline is progressing, and I, I should mention that uh, it does continue in issue number five. It's the both on Eiffel or the backup. Mm -hmm. um, the way that it's moving, um, it's more towards monogamy for Eiffel. He's getting older. He's hit a certain age, uh, 
and he really liked Hope a lot. So we're going to explore that a little bit. But um, Smusher, the one of the other characters, is taking over the book uh, with number five. He has a worse date. Uh, so I mean, and, and a worse date for him is way different than it is for Oprah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, maybe not so much for Eiffel, but that concept can definitely stretch over to some of the other characters. Okay, well, let's shift away from Oath a little bit. In the past year, Grant Morrison became the editor-in-chief of Heavy Metal, and in one of the first few issues after he took the uh, the mantle of editor-in-chief, uh, there was a pretty much a sex-based issue that came out and had a story of yours called Space Jizz. So I was wondering <laughs> if you could tell us about that. <laughs> Sure. Uh, that the title is awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was just the working title, too. And, and when it came time to, uh, to sort of put the cherry on that story, uh, uh, I forget if it was Jeff, the publisher, or Kristen, his wife, Grant Morrison's wife, that said, is this, is this the title? And I was like, yeah, I, you know, uh, can you come up with a better one? <laughs> you know, <laughs> thing. And they were like, no, that's fine. Uh, but uh, to go back, how I, how I got involved in that was uh, Isotope Comics is my local comic shop in San Francisco. I live half a block away. Uh, James Simon and uh, uh, Kirsten Bulldog have been um, really uh, instrumental in, in helping me get the work out and being like a home base um, store for, for what I do. Um, they always have artists coming in. Um, they worked with Grant uh, for uh, Morrison Con, which happened uh, a handful of years ago in Las Vegas. Uh, so Grant was, and, and Kristen were in town to promote his book, I think it was Super Gods, his prose mm -hmm. novel. And James, as he always does with, uh, when someone comes in, said, you have got to give them your comics. I know them. They will love your comics. I was very, I had many reservations about doing that because I've given my comics out to people before, people that I've been huge fans of, you know, well-known artists and, and writers. And most of the time the response is pretty lukewarm because I don't draw superhero stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm giving it to the superhero people. Um, but as soon as I gave those books to Grant and Kristen in unison, in their beautiful accents, they said, bears or whatever. I can't even like do it. <laughs> um, just they shouted it and they poured over it and they looked at it and they were very, very excited. And I was like, oh, cool. This was not you know a missed opportunity. Um, and I thought that would sort of be the end of it. Um, I always urge people uh, in indie comics, do San Diego Comic-Con, but go, just go there, show up. Um, and that's been my my own personal uh, mantra since uh, nine years ago, I started going. Um, so after I met those two, Kristen kept coming to my booth in Comic-Con year after year. Would always pick up stuff, um, we'd chat a little bit, um, and that was wonderful. You know, she was she was really friendly. And again, not I was never expecting anything. I always just spent time talking with her. Um, so yes, when the uh, the opportunity arose, when he he started the heavy metal uh, editorship, I guess you would call it, um, I they contacted me and they were like, "Would you like to do something? Would you like to do something for the sex issue?" And you guys are are familiar with what I do. I have not done really any erotic comics at all. Uh, I purposefully eschewed that just because, like, the superhero thing, it's never really felt like I've had something to say. Uh, mm -hmm. There are people out that out there that do it brilliantly, do queer erotic comics wonderfully. Um, I just feel like I didn't, I haven't really had anything to say. Um, so that, as a result, I've, I've eschewed that kind of content. But I did have a, a story, you know, I could not say no to this opportunity. So uh, within a couple hours, I hacked something out and, and sent it off to them and, and they loved it. And I didn't realize actually how much they loved it until Comic-Con. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I got on the panel with them, which again was like a, a, a must not miss lifetime opportunity. And Grant was talking about some of his favorite stuff in there. And he said, and space jizz and the audience all giggled and laughed um so yeah it was really uh i thought my story was really way out there um i should mention it's edited it was edited quite a bit they said do whatever you want um but you may you may have to dial it back so uh, i did have to create two alternative pages for that and those are in the digital version i believe they did publish them yeah, so you, you can get it. And I expect uh, there was a year uh, clause in the, the contract that I could not publish it 
until a year after it came out. So I will probably release the erotic full on juicy version at some point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the long and short of it. Steve, anything else there? Well, you know, I know that, you know, in Wobble Below, you may have done cats to death, but uh, tell us about cats. Tell us how much you love cats. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Everybody thinks, uh, they ask me at shows, like, you must have how many cats? cats. You have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer is I just have one, and she is more than enough. She is plenty. <laughs> Um, she's a tiny little cat. She's a you know, full, full adult, um, five-year-old cat, but she's very, she's put the runs of her liver and she has little dog syndrome. She pretends like, you know, she's five or six times her actual size. Uh, but no, I, I love cats. I grew up with dogs. Um, when it came time and I was an adult and I wanted a pet, it felt very irresponsible to get a dog. So I got my first cat. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> So I'm going to go dark for a second. Uh, she was born with a uh, feline equivalent of HIV. Yeah. yeah. No, no. There, there is, it's called FIP. FIP. It's, yeah. It's big, yeah. It's, it's a, it is an immune system to the HIV. Um, and she was born with it. We didn't know when we got her from the shelter. Um, and she didn't make it to a year. Oh. So, uh, I was really depressed. Uh, I tried again. My first cat, other cat that I got, uh, I named Maz. He was gray. He looked, like Laura C. Persona <laughs> Kind um, And uh, we got another cat named Hugo. Uh, this was in my previous relationship. And uh, unfortunately, that ended, and I didn't want to break the cats up too. So I left the two cats with my ex and promptly moved to San Francisco and started making this comic. And as a result, you know, of missing those cats, the, com uh, the cats featured very prominently in the plot for the comic. Um, so, yeah, I just love them. They're these little wild creatures that we let into our homes. I don't care how domesticated, you know, we want to talk about them being. They are full of weird tics and behavior. And a lot of what I do in the comic is is meant to uh, try and explain that behavior, uh, especially with Pavel, the, the special needs kitty. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I use them to make commentary on Oz, uh, in the, the, I think it's the third, second and third issue of the Oak comic. There's a very, uh, there's a prison riot scene in the, the cat orphanage. That's my commentary on, on the HBO show Oz. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just, aesthetically, I think, uh, cats are beautiful. Uh, I'm sorry, dog folks. Again, I love dogs, but dogs are clumsy and embarrassing and ill designed compared to cats. Sorry, <laughs> dog folks. Uh, I, as I said, I love dogs, but cats are just these, uh, they're very aesthetically well designed. Yeah, as someone who, uh, for the past three days, uh, one of the cats has very brazenly peed on the bed, just stare, like, it's very odd. Um, you know, like you said, dogs are embarrassing and clumsy. So when you're out walking a dog and the dog has to do his business, it's always like, ugh, this is so weird and uncomfortable for both of us to be in the same place at the same time. A cat will go ahead and do its business and not make a big show about it. So it looks like he was just sitting there having a good time until he gets up and there's a big puddle. Um, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've had to watch The Comforter and The Sheets three nights in a row. It's yeah. it's ridiculous. You know, I'll walk in there and there it is. But, but we still love them. Cats are are bizarre and, and wacky and strange and funny and cute and mean, but they're mm -hmm. also wonderful. So, <laughs> so yes, I, I feel, I feel some kinship with cats, with the love of cats. Cats are very metal. You know, I, I know I have a lot of heavy metal uh, friends and, and some of them are musicians. And with the exception of Tom, uh, whose dog is wonderful and we've had for so long. And also because he's allergic to cats, uh, they are all cat people. Um, it's like cats and bats. Those are my two favorite animals, and and goats, obviously. Um, those are my my favorite uh, animals. <laughs> okay, uh, if I can just sneak one more music question in. Oh, um, absolutely. One thing that really drew me to your work initially was like I could see, in a lot of ways, that it was the spiritual for me, a spiritual cousin of of things that I grew up with, like Love and Rockets. 
you know, mm-hmm. was, was this mishmash of disparate elements that somehow wove together and told very touching stories and frameworks that you may not have expected from the outset. And for some reason, it's like the little devil that's tapping me on the back of the shoulder that's making me ask you this. Do you remember rock and roll comics from the early 90s? Oh, yeah, vaguely. I didn't any of them but i remember it was the sort of thing that even at uh, in my teens i looked at it and it seemed kind of sketchy and uh not uh, authorized <laughs> right <laughs> but yeah. i was wondering if you were forced to tackle a biographical comic of a band which one would you want to choose i mean definitely the those were done by that original run of rock and roll comics i i remember looking and and seriously considering buying the prince one uh-huh. uh that's him on his motorcycle, and it's you know, the cover's pretty good. I didn't get a chance to look at the interior art, but this was like five or six years ago in Portland. Even then, it was like forty bucks. And I was like, mm, I, I, I'm in for with this. But if we're talking of, of maybe a band that didn't get covered, did they ever do the Plasmatics? I don't think they did. I don't the think they did. Yeah, yeah. I would love to do the Plasmatic or the Cramps. Mm-hmm. Um, visually, that would be very, very fun to draw. Um, Divine, uh, who was a musician in her own right, um, which I don't think people really realize actually how much music uh, she made. I would, I would love to do a Divine comic. Uh, I've already done the cover for it. Uh, I did a, I participated in a, a Divine theme show and I did a fake comic cover for that. So maybe one of those three, definitely. Okay. And I'd buy the shit out of that Divine one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's there comes I, I again in strategizing with James at Isotope, uh we often talk about what my because indie comics folks, their career trajectory is typically they, they do a project that a little cult following kind of gathers around and then they do an auto bio I'm sorry, they do a bio comic or an auto bio comic. And James and I always talk about who who would be my bio comic person. Uh and it, I I'm very close to trying to figure out how to do a divine one because there there hasn't been one. And just tying it into what preceded this question was, you know, seeing some of the influences that you had. What about books today? What's turning you on in relation to comics today? What are the things that you're liking? Mm, gosh, um, I like uh, I, I in teaching at California College of the Arts, I work with the, the MFA comics grads. And there are always these lofty academic discussions about um, what comics we're reading right now. I and I always very upfront say I like a lot of trash. I really <laughs> love trash, comics. Um, or as you had said earlier, comics with an X at the end. Now, having said that, I'm going to mention a bunch of people whose work that I like, uh, and I don't mean to insinuate that their work is trash in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but I do tend to like um, the uh, kind of uh, more I'm struggling to find a very sensitive way of putting it. I do like the more kind of dangerous and transgressive uh, mm-hmm. art that are out there right now. A lot of them are not very popular with um, you know, gay people, women, um, certain minorities. Um, they tend to walk this line of offense. Uh, a lot of them have drifted away from the public eye and started working on cartoons and things like that. Um, but I, I always like the Prison Pit books that John mm-hmm. Bryan has done. There are a lot of what we would call problematic things in there. A lot of people really dislike certain volumes in there. I will not defend some of the stuff that's in there and some of the language and some of the imagery. But that first Prison Pit book is some of the best gay erotic porn comics that have been made in like the last 10 years. Um, so I'm very much looking forward for the, the next Johnny Ryan joint. Um, Benjamin Myra, uh, mm-hmm. who also is on Fanographics, um, he released, I think it was last year or the year before, uh, Terror Assaulter, uh, One Man War on Terror. I think I got that right. Um, I was pushing that on a lot of my um, gay male uh, friends because it is completely pansexual. The main character um, has sex with every gender type in every sort of situation, and uh, it's intimately interlocked with a lot of violence. Uh, have either of you seen this at all? I haven't seen that, but a book I absolutely loved was The Incredibly Fantastic Adventures of Maureen Dowd that he had done. Oh, God. I have that. 
Yeah. I have that comic. It is ridiculous. It but is yeah, insane. no, I, I was, yeah. Uh, every um, time that I walk by his table, uh, by at his booth at Heroes Con, he's not there. So, because <laughs> he's I, he's been there, I think the past couple of years at least. But uh, I just he's never there when I'm when I walk let by. Let me quickly quickly sell you on the Terra Salter book. There's a scene in which he decides to have sex with a male flight attendant. So already we're in dangerous stereotype territory. <laughs> uh, but he has to land the plane and have sex with the flight attendant, crash land it. Uh, and it's amazing. It's like I said, it's the specificity of the erotics in it. Uh, I, I call myself a, I love uh, situational erotics, and I think of um, Prison Pit as being that, and and Terrorist Helper as being that. Um, but uh, on top of that, because and this was before that Terrorist Helper book came out, I asked him uh, at a show. Uh, he was actually at this table in this case. If he wanted to do something gay for pay. Uh, and he said, yeah, absolutely, without even hearing what I was going to ask him to do. Uh, so I wrote him a story that I, I released in the, one of the Open Anthology books, which is a collection of other creators um, drawing my characters. And he just did this amazing ogre story. Um, it's wonderful. It's it's all about um, the ogre is oaf rescuing an elf who is Eiffel uh, from a religious zealot who's trying to hurt him at the stake. So. Um, he did a, a fantastic job of that. I'm trying to think. Of, I mean, my I have piles of comics all around me um, <laughs> that I have I have yet to read. But I, I really enjoy a lot of what Image is doing lately. Uh, I love the humans that that Tom uh, Neely and Keenan Marshall Keller were writing. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, there was recently that Cage book. If we're talking mainstream comics, mm-hmm. that uh, the I forget his name was a Russian animator. Um, put out, uh, and it was a throwback exploitation take on Luke Cage. Um, I think it may have just wrapped up, <clears throat> actually. Uh, that was beautifully drawn uh, outside of the continuity of the, the current Marvel universe. Uh, Super Fuckers by James Kolchaka. Love that mm-hmm. book. First read, every week that it came out, it wrapped up around Christmas. It was just a five-issue miniseries. Um, I love that book. Uh, it's a very free book. If you're familiar with, with what he does, he came up with this wonderful concept that just unshackled him from, you know, the confines of, of uh, you know, some of maybe his other work. It's clearly a book that he's doing to just sort of have fun and and be, again, transgressive and be really un-PC. Um, and it's a superhero book, so... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I would highly recommend that one. Yeah. One of the names I was so happy to see among the Oath Anthology names is Jim Rugg. <laughs> I just think his work, aphrodisiac especially, it's almost like this amazing salad that, <laughs> that everything goes in, but it all tastes good, though shouldn't. That yeah. I have within, within grabbing reach because <laughs> yeah. on my desk, uh, I, I have my sort of reference comic. And when I mention on PC, I, I do kind of think of, a comic like this it's it's not uh irresponsibly hard in its depiction but it is sort of stereotypical and it is exploitation and i mean i would say no more so than that cage comic that you know i was mentioning mm. where we really picked it apart and broke it down we would have a lot of negative things potentially to say about it but what you're saying about this the the um aphrodisiac book you could also say a street angel which i think is mm-hmm. a really uh, wonderful and beautiful book that he's been de- developing lately those Street Angel minis, if you can get your hands on them, are just mm. my favorite comics. Yeah. Uh, oh, they're great. They're so good. They're I I can't remember who recommended some somebody. I might have might have been another podcast recommended Street Angel to me, and I was like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And I picked up the first volume, and just I fell in love with her. Yeah. You know, I I don't know. And that Rambo three point five. <laughs> if you have that mini comic, yeah. oh my god, that is so fun. Yeah, I need to look for that then. Well, Ed, I know we're catching you between appearance clusters. So what do you <laughs> have coming up in the near future? Yeah, I just finished up a little mini tour that was a lot of fun for the the blood and metal book the, the fanographics book um it was mainly fun because i got to at most of the signings uh whether they were in san francisco portland seattle uh or in san francisco again have a half naked man stand beside me <laughs> dressed up in blood uh, that was that was a blast and something new that i just tried and i got dressed up in, in a costume as well um but yeah the next uh, the next show that i have i'm, I'm looking at my calendar uh, it is the LA Art Book Fair, which takes place at the Geffen Contemporary in downtown. Uh, that's from February 23rd to 26th. 
And that is not so much a comic show as it is a, a sort of zine and art book show, but um, because it's run by the, and you guys may be familiar, uh, it's run by the New York Gay Art Mafia, which mm-hmm. is a, a real thing. <laughs> uh, it's centered around printed matter. Um, I They let me in every year. One of the few comic creators that, that they actually do let in. Um, so I'll, I'll be there for that. I'm trying to think down the line. I'm going to be doing TCAP, uh, the, the Toronto show. Um, what else? Yeah, it's sort of a stop and start for the next couple of months. I, I'm purposefully not doing so many shows so I can get drawing on this new book that is supposed to drop in, in the fall, the wrestling book that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will be releasing Mobile 05 in time for, for the LA Art Book Fair. So the continuation of that that story from the big fat uh, first volume, the, the black and white volume, will start to see life in those single issues. Right. Are the Vice web comics continuing? I did another short run of those, and uh, I guess it's worth mentioning for for a free comic book day, which is in May, right? Right. Uh, Fanographics is putting together for the first time a compilation that I think does not include the Hernandez brothers. It's not a love <laughs> uh It's all of their current stable of, of people that are are putting work out. So Simon Hanselman, um, Noah Van Skyver, and I have four pages in that, which are uh, four pages from the short run of Vice comics I did where we. Uh, a female wrestler named Disastra takes over uh, the mm-hmm. reign. So it's a, a very short, um, you know, four single scripts, but that will see its first publication in that, that free comic book day, uh, fan graphics collection. Um, that, that'll be that. Cool. It's awesome. And if people want to reach out to you on the interwebs, what are your points of contact? I'm pretty much on everything. If you just search for Wubble, uh W-U-B-A-D-L-E, Oak, uh, on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, I have my own horrible, really way out of date, uh, website that is just basically a glorified shopping cart, but that's well, <laughs> um, um, yeah, I'm on pretty much everything. Uh, yeah, you can, you can find me there. All right, great. Again, Ed, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a blast. People don't know. We usually don't have video, but as we're recording this, we're seeing Ed on video and he's so cute. So, <laughs> it's yeah, me. It's thank you so much for having me on. Uh, you know, I, I've known you, Bill, for for a couple of years. I think we met at the the Queers and Comics Expo, right? Or, uh, comics, right? Or we saw each other most recently there, which uh, is worth mentioning. That will be another appearance that'll that'll happen um, uh, in April. I believe it's uh, the second week of April. Uh, I'm such a bad. Yeah, that that sounds right. And and is that their plan yeah. that they're going to bounce back and forth between the East Coast and the West Coast? Biannually? I, I, I yeah. believe so. It's really up to yeah. Jennifer Camper. Uh, I, I heard rumblings of, of a West Coast one happening at the end of the East Coast one. So uh, one would expect at a certain point during, the, given the political environment, they would want to have one somewhere in the Midwest as well, which right. everybody kind of meets in the middle for. Yeah. I think a Chicago one or, or even, even further West, proper Midwest would be would be great for that too. But but yeah, that that's going to be two days of panels. I'm I'm on three of them. I'm moderating one. Um, are you going to make that make it out for that? Unfortunately, no. That's coming at a strange time. So sure. you know, if there's a lottery win between now and then, you know, <laughs> I'll get myself <laughs> over. But as of right now, I don't think that's possible. But I think it's worth making a pitch for that event because it really was a a wonderful conference slash symposium slash love in, you know, that uh, it, it really is something. And I'm really glad to hear that you're going to be participating in that the second time that they're having this conference. Yeah, it's, it's more important now than ever to get us all together. And uh, my big stake in this whole political situation of people is to, to tell our stories. Uh, when I was closeted in the, the mid nineties, um, it was movies, it was TV shows. It was seeing these people that I could relate to. And not all of those, those movies and TV shows have aged particularly well, but seeing people's stories being told and, and having that out there and, and having that validation was really important for me. So I just feel like we're caught up in that cycle. Again, we need to all, um, get out there, tell personal stories, um, humanize wind hearts and minds. That's, that's the only thing that's going to kind of get us through this. All Visibility right. and outreach. Yeah. 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 Thank you guys again so much. This was really fun. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for, for joining us. This is awesome.
Well, thanks for listening to our interview with Ed Luce. We're going to wrap up this episode, and when we wrap up an episode of Comic Book Bears, we provide something to you, which is what we call the Wolfs of the Week, where we spotlight something, be it a comic book or a television show, a movie, charitable initiative, crowdfunding campaign, anything under the sun that we think deserves some attention. Steve, let us know what your Wolf of the Week is. My Wolf of the Week is uh, apparently relatively controversial. Um, It's divided a lot of people who have watched watch the show and some who refuse to uh and that is nbc's emerald city which is their reimagining of oz uh and several people have mentioned this and i think this is one of their taglines uh if wizard of oz met uh game of thrones so of course they've made everything a lot more emotionally impactful there's a lot more drama and a lot of really really cool and extremely violent set pieces um the acting is is pretty good. I think that the that the characters are are really well done. It's very fascinating. There's a lot of lore that's thrown in there, some from the books, but then also they you know they make up some of their own to keep the things you know keep everything moving. Um, it's beautifully shot. Tarzan Singh is the executive producer, and of course because of that, um, you know scenes are beautiful, colors are vibrant, um, and uh, it just looks like. Well, you know, like a painting a lot of times. But there's also a wolf within this wolf, and that is for Oliver Jackson Cohen, um, who plays uh, basically the Scarecrow, uh, who is named Lucas in the show. Uh, Dorothy names him Lucas uh, because he can't remember his name. But, man, the first time you see him, shirtless. Most of the time you see him, completely open shirt, lots of fur, very... Very cute. Anyway, um, and of course, for those of you who like the uh, the bigger dudes, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio is looking very puffy um, with his uh, you know crazy wig and big old beard. So uh, anyway, I, I do recommend the series. Give it a shot, and also uh, give it a shot for the eye candy. Why not? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. My wolf of the week, since we didn't really talk current comics this week goes out to Justice League of America Rebirth, the Ray one-shot, written by Steve Orlando, with art by Stephen Byrne. The book springs out of the current Justice League vs. Suicide Squad event that's happening right now. At the end of that event, we're going to have a new version of the Justice League of America, and one of the members is the Ray, and the Ray in this incarnation is Ray Terrell, who grew up in the suburban areas surrounding Philly, and this young man apparently has an allergy to light, So he is basically surrounded by darkness, and most of his connection to the outside world, apart from his mother, is through television. The allergy to light actually turns out to be particular powers that he has developed. And what you see crafted throughout the story is essentially a coming out story, where this young man is literally in the dark and gradually through events that include a best friend of his growing up who ends up becoming a political figure brings the ray out into the world and i think this is the kind of book that we need right now at a time where there is so much potential darkness that might loom over the lgbt community given the political climate that currently exists in the united states it's nice to see a book that literally is a ray of light so that's my wolf the justice league of america rebirth ray one shot okay well that's another one for the ages again we are the comic book bears podcast you can find us on the twitter and the tumblr and the instagram as comic book bears you can find us on facebook as comic book bears podcast you can subscribe to us through itunes and if you want to reach out to us you can always do so by sending an email to comicbookbears at gmail.com. So until next time, I'm Billy Z. And I'm Steve Morey. You're going to hear a wolf in an explosion. We'll be back real soon. Take care, everyone. Wolf! Wolf!